Good morning, everybody. We're going to start in 1 Kings chapter 4. And we're going to ask the Lord to bless our time together this morning. Father in heaven, we certainly do thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be gathered together, Father, uh, under the preaching of your word. Father, uh, Lord, thank you for the authority in your word. And thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Father, I just thank you for the brethren that have gathered this morning, Lord. I do pray that, uh, Lord, that you might be able to bless them today, Father, as they've sacrificed their time and come this morning, Father, to be in the Sunday school hour. God, we just thank you. Ask your blessing. Put me aside. I do pray, Father, that your word would go forth and accomplish your will in each and every one of us, and me especially, in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. All right. Got a lot of ground to cover. And... Uh, we're going to start in uh, chapter 4, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. So King Solomon was king over all Israel. Now look at verse 24. And he had dominion over all the region, this side of the river, from Tisphod even to uh, Aza, over all the kings on this side of the river. He had peace on all sides round about. Uh, verse 25, and Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So there's peace, there's a united kingdom, and things are, things are looking good. But you've got to understand something. Peace didn't come cheap, and it didn't come easy, and it's the same today. Very same thing today. What happened? David. David made incredible preparation for his son Solomon to take over the kingdom. Under David, the kingdom is united. Under David, God used that man to accomplish his will. He brought those people, the, uh, the people in Canaan, he brought those people under submission to David's rule and authority as David walked with God. Peace. Peace is expensive. It's always expensive. And once you've, uh, once you've acquired it, you can't just sit and relax. It takes constant work, maintenance. It, it has to be worked at. It has to be maintained. It doesn't just happen. So let's just look at David for a moment here. Look at, uh, look at Psalm 144. Psalm 144, if I can find it. Psalm 144. Look at this, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. This is David, not Solomon. Teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My goodness and my fortress my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, and he whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. David was a man of war. David was a great man of war. Look at 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 22. Incidentally, this is the first time I've done Sunday school here. I, uh, I, I got here in 04, went to Bible school, <laughs> left, in, left in 09 and haven't been back. <laughs> Not that I don't want to be, but... All right, look at chapter 22. Did I say that? Look at verse 7. And David said to Solomon, my son... Uh, David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, my son shall, a son shall be born to thee, uh, whom shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from his enemies round about, and his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel all his days. Well... Solomon walked right into a great situation. He was born into a great situation. But it took a lot of work on David's part. Not only this in the physical world, the physical uh, warfare that he had, 
But then you, you, you all know the, the story. He's, he, had to, uh, he amassed this great fortune of uh, gold and silver and brass and iron and whatnot, all these things for the, uh, for the temple that he wanted to build. But because of his life, God had to set him aside, not punishment, but said, no, no, I, I can't have my house established on, on, a, on warfare. It's peace. Solomon's going to be a man of peace, and it's through him that I'm going to build my house. Now, um, look at, uh, just give you an idea of some of the, the attributes of David. Look at the uh, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 5. And just start down in verse 9. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, Hiram, <laughs> king of Tyre, sent messages to David, messages to David, and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David an house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people's, people Israel's sake. Tyre, that's Lebanon. So the reputation of David and his accomplishments in warfare have spread well beyond the borders of Israel. It's all the way to uh, Lebanon. And this king, Hiram, is so impressed with, uh, with King David and with his accomplishments, and he had to see something in him that impressed him. Probably integrity, uh, just God's hand upon him. What happens next? 1 Kings chapter 5. Well, I mean, think about it. King Hiram, he turns around and he sends um, uh, all these building materials for David's house. You read, you read also that uh, uh, Hiram was ever a lover of David. He had such grand respect for him. Look at 1 Kings chapter 5. And Solomon sent to Hiram. Ah, Siren, uh, Hi, Solomon sent to Hiram saying, Thou knowest how that God, uh, that David, my father, could not build an house unto the name of the Lord his God, for the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. Well, clearly God was using, uh, was using David to accomplish his will. Uh, but now, verse 4, the Lord my God hath given me, Solomon, rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. What's going on? David, I'm sorry, Solomon. Solomon's a man of peace. David was a man of war. Here you see Solomon. Solomon, everything that David was with a sword in his hand, Solomon is with a word in his mouth. The man of war, the man of peace. David picks up the sword. David forces people into submission. God's will, God in Canaan land. Solomon, Solomon's a diplomat. Look what he says. Well, you know how God was with David and because of his, uh, because of his warfare and the shedding of blood, he couldn't build that, that temple, but now, now, God's given David, God's honoring David through me. He uses, he uses diplomacy. And what ends up happening? King Hiram now turns around and sends all of these building materials, sends people to come and work for him. They hew down trees. They make uh, rafts out of them, float them down to, to the coast of Israel where Solomon's men recover them, pull them out of the water, start building the temple. I'm getting ahead of myself, but... You, you, you get the idea here. Not only is he a diplomat, what, what has he done here? I mean, he's restated the friendship. You remember, you know, so, uh, Ty, uh, Hiram, you remember the friendship, the, the camaraderie that you had with my father? I want to build on that relationship. 
See, this is wise. This is wisdom long before you read about God imparting this incredible wisdom to him. Think about it. If, if David's the man of war that the reputation around here uh, indicates, what Solomon could have done is simply said, now look, you remember how it was with my dad. I learned a lot from my father. You know, I, I could call his mighty men. They're still in his, uh, in his council, if you will, here. He didn't, he didn't uh, dismiss all the counsel that David had amassed. Those men, these were some wise men, some powerful men, those mighty men. They're still, they're on Solomon's side now. We could have done is just, Ty, uh, uh, Hiram, you really do need to give me those logs. You really do need to give me that gold and all that other stuff, because after all, I want to build a house for my God. It's not even Hiram's God. He's Lebanese. <laughs> all right, so you get the point. Diplomatic, but he's also ambassadorial. Look at 1 Kings chapter 5, look at verse 5. And behold, I propose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon the throne in thy room, he shall build a house in my name. Now therefore command thou that you hew, uh, they hew uh, cedar trees out of Lebanon. My servant shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there was uh, there is none among us that can skill to hew timber like to Sidonians. He's flattering him. He's using diplomacy. He's an ambassador. This is Henry Kissinger. He's saying all the right things. And instead of force, he's using the power of the word. Now, and it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon, that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which hath given David a wise son over this great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I've considered. I've considered the thing which thou sent to me, to, uh, to me for, and I will do all that I desire concerning the timber of cedar and the, uh, the concerning the timber of fir, and my servants shall bring them down to Lebanon to the sea. So what David accomplished mightily, physically, that was, plow that was establishing the beachhead. It had to be that way. You had to go in and clean house. And that established, that established the kingdom. Now God sends Solomon in. And what is Solomon doing? He's putting aside that sword, and he's using, he's using politics, if you will, but diplomacy, that ambassadorial relationship. And so instead of breaking and cutting down, he's building up. He's building up. He's using relationship, the power of personality, the power of the, the spoken word. It's in truth. I mean, it's, this isn't flattery. He's using, he's speaking the truth. God turns around and honors all that. Now, I like that. It says Hiram considered the matter, considered what Solomon had asked him to do. Well, think about it. Again, Hiram's not stupid. There's a lot of wise people in this, in this narrative. And, and what's going on? Hiram says, let's see. I know David, or I knew David. I, I, re I really appreciated David. I had a lot of respect for David. Well, it was wise to have respect for David in that day. <laughs> he, was the, he, was the, he had the army, man, and anything that he wanted to do, he could pretty much get done. Come on, think about it. He's got mighty men who break through the Philistine, uh, the host of the Philistines, to grab David a cup of water. <laughs> He's got a lot of respect uh, by his men. So Hiram had to have heard about that. Think about it. David's a man of war. His son's now on the throne. He's a man of peace. War, peace. Mm. I think I'll do, I'm going to consider what Solomon said. I think I'm going to go with Solomon. I want in on this project because God's going to bless him. I can get in. Maybe he'll bless me in my country as well. I mean, it's, it's just wise. There's a lot of wise people in this narrative. That's good. Just, just. Good thinking. All right. Now, um, 
What, what about this wisdom of Solomon? He's still in 1 Kings, right? Go back to chapter 4 for a moment. Look at verse 29. And, yeah, verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much, and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children in the east country, and all the wisdom of Egypt. <clears throat> And he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, and, uh, and Heman the, the, the Calco, uh, and Calco, and Darda, the sons of uh, Meho. And his fame was in all nations round about. Um, it, it's amazing. You go in verse 32, he spake all these proverbs, these songs, and whatnot. Down in verse 34, and there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from the kings of the earth, from all the kings, uh, kings of the earth, uh, which had heard of his wisdom. So his reputation has gone out just like David's had. Only, as we said, instead of a man of war, the reputation of might and power, conquer, what is it? His wisdom has gone out. Now, we all know the, the probably the most talked about and quoted uh, manifestation of that wisdom <coughs> is... The, the, two, the two women, the two prostitutes, they, they get pregnant, they have babies. One of them overlays one of them in, in her sleep. That one dies. The other one takes the live baby and says, this is mine, the dead one's yours. They have an argument. They take it to the king, King Solomon. And uh, you know the story. He says, give me a sword. What? <laughs> That's David's role. What are you doing? Give me a sword. Where's the live baby? All right, we're going to hack this kid in half. Both people, both mothers can have a half. You know the story. What happens? The live mother, I'm the live mother, <laughs> the, the mother of the live child, her heart is, is, is broken. No, 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 don't, don't, don't touch the baby. Don't touch. Go ahead. She can have him. She can have him. And the other woman says, she must have been a real princess. Says, no, no, let's, let's, let's kill them all. Let's kill this one, too, and we're both sharing well, <laughs> you know, that's the wisdom. That's the, wisdom. That's, that's the reputation that, that Solomon had gained. Now, um, look at... Um, no, let's not. <laughs> uh, okay, where's the wisdom, coming, the wisdom coming from, though? You're still in 1 Kings, and I've got a chapter 3. Chapter 3, what is that in verse 5? In Gibeon, the Lord appeared unto Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed the, uh, unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and, up, uh, righteousness and uprightness of heart with thee, that thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on the throne as it is this day and now, O Lord my God. Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people. It cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. Um, for who is able to judge this so great people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Okay. Stop there for a minute. <clears throat> what just took place, verses 5 and 6, God just tested Solomon. He just gave Solomon the opportunity to prove his integrity, to prove the wisdom that he's already developing. What did he do? He credits David for where he's at now. He's not claiming anything for himself. What does he do? I'm but a child. Well, um, well, first off, as he, like I said, he, he credits David. That's Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, honor thy father and thy mother. Verse 7, he humbles himself and says, I'm but a child. That's Matthew 18, chapter 4. Humble thyself as a child, uh, be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 13. I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there is not any among the kings uh, un unto, the, uh, or unto the, all the days, all thy days. 
and if thou will walk the ways, keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk before me, then I'll lengthen thy days. Solomon didn't ask for any of those things. What is it? Matthew, uh, Matthew, chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 33. Seek at first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's wisdom. It's wisdom. And that wisdom's available to anybody, everywhere, anytime. We don't have to have, you know, God give us this magnificent uh, supernatural wisdom as he did, as he did for Solomon. But uh, you still in First Kings? Yeah. Go, go to chapter 6 now. This... This is where I find it starts getting a little peculiar in my mind. Chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. All right. This is, this is God's intention. This is, this is God's intention. This is his call on Solomon's life, if you will. Look at verse 7. And the house, yeah, let's just, and the house, when it was, uh, was in building, was built of stone. It was a pretty solid structure. Built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. <coughs> Isn't that peculiar? Think about that. I mean, you know, Brother Stephen Mustard, he's a mason. I, he, he, he was up at, the, uh, up at our compound a, couple, a year or so back and uh, helped lay the foundation for what's going to be our church building. And he's out there with a hammer, man. <laughs> uh, masons use hammers. They build in stone. They build with stone. Use it. Why would God say no, 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 we're not doing that here. So think about it. He had to take, those, those masons had to take those stones out of the quarry. It took machi uh, machines, <laughs> it took tools to get that stone out of the quarry. They had to move it fr from, the, from the quarrying site and then start forming those things. So it took a hammer, it took a chisel. They had to work on those things. They had to form them. It says that those things were fit before they got there. That's, that's, that's something, man. That's a skill. <laughs> and they got there, and then they were simply put in place. You know, there was a song several years ago, Just Another Brick in the Wall. Well, <laughs> I don't bring back any bad memories, but <laughs> another brick in the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Payback. <laughs> Come on. Those things had to be just oh so, because they fit right where they were supposed to be. Solomon's a fit rock, a fit stone. He's right where he's supposed to be, and he's doing exactly what God wants him to do, just like his father David had done before him. There's a spiritual lesson in that for us as well. But let's look at this. Go back to Exodus chapter 20 for a minute, please. Make a little more sense out of this, I hope. Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. Where am I here? Yeah, 20. Here we are. 22. Look, look, uh, chapter 20, verse 22. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. I like that. Uh, that's like Acts chapter 1, verse 3, many infallible proofs. <laughs> you, shall not make, uh, you shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make uh, gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, in all places where I record my name. I will come uh, unto thee, <clears throat> and I will bless thee. An altar. It's an earthen altar. Now, I don't know what that is, but I'm assuming 
you know, over in Africa, uh, they, they, they make blocks out of mud. It's just, just dirt, mix it up with some water, stomp it around a bit, put it in a little uh, four-sided frame, and put it out in the sun. And within a week, that thing is as hard as a brick. <clears throat> I don't know if that's what they did or not, but it's an earthen altar, which means man had nothing to do with it. He just took, whether it were a pile of, a pile of dirt, I don't know. But man's hands had nothing to do with that other than collecting the material together. Got no claim to any fame in that thing. Look at, um, <clears throat> did I read verse 25? No. Um, verse 25, and if thou will make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up uh, thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. No tools, just like in the building of the temple, Solomon you don't lift up a tool on that thing. Your people, you do it over there in Lebanon. You do it over there in the outback. <clears throat> you're, not bringing those, you're not bringing that sound in here. Why? Now, how about uh, Titus 3.5? You know, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. No self-aggrandizement. No claim to fame. Simply, God gave the, the materials you now just do what I told you to do. You worship, but you worship my way. I don't want you adding anything to it. I don't want you subtracting anything from it. Yeah. <clears throat> These tools, uh, I hope this makes sense to everybody. Look at verse 23. You shall not make gods of silver and gods of gold. And in the same context, in the same couple of verses there, talking about idol worship, and he's talking about an altar. He gives you two altars. You're not to do anything to alter the altar. <laughs> he doesn't want us taking any, any, any part in this, uh, this thing at all. Look at verse, uh, look, uh, chapter uh, 32. Yeah, chapter 32. <clears throat> Got it, 32. Look at, uh, just start in verse 1. It says, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which should go before us. For as, this, uh, for, as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not where was become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in, the, in your ears, your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And... He received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. Hmm. After, after he had made the molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of his, uh, Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow's a feast unto the Lord. A graving tool. Well, and it's in the context of an altar that Aaron built. You don't know what it's built out of, but I don't know that Aaron knows anything but what he learned in Egypt. And so <clears throat> we, I think we can safely assume it was, a, it was an altar that he had a whole lot of input on, like maybe his own style, design, and uh, manner of construction. But the point is, is that you got another ins, uh, instance here of of a tool being used, and it's connected with this idolatry, this idol worship, the worship of a golden calf, right? <clears throat> look, at, um, look at Deuteronomy 27. Verse 4, therefore it shall be when you be gone over Jordan. Okay, so this is, the, they're going to be leaving uh, Moses behind and going into the promised land. Ye shall, ye shall set up these stones which I command you this day, 
uh, in Mount Ebal, <clears throat> thou shalt plaster them with plaster, and there thou shalt build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt build an altar of the Lord uh, thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt uh, offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. Uh, and thou shalt offer peace offerings and it goes through all of that. Then verse 8, uh, thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. Again, the admonition, you don't lift up a tool on this altar of mine. This is all about me, God, and I don't want you, I don't want you altering anything. I don't want you trying to take any of the, uh, the glory for this. Um, why? Think about that graving tool. Um, it's a polluted tool. Why? because it's held in the hands of an unregenerated heart with an unsanctified imagination and without the guiding uh, uh, influence of the Holy Spirit, what happens? The minute, the minute pride gets just a, just a touch into that heart, what happens? Instantly the thing just escalates, the thing exponentially increases. Don't build an altar of stones that you've put your hand to because now you're polluted with pride, your pride. You're going to try to take credit for this thing. God says, we're not doing it that way at all. Okay. A graving tool, a hammer, uh, iron, tools of iron. <clears throat> Look at uh, Isaiah 41. Quarter after, wow, I'm not going to make it. All right, we're going to have to cut through a lot of this. <laughs> My first time doing Sunday school, so what do I know? Nobody gave me instruction. I didn't get checked out on this. <laughs> Look at uh, uh, what is that? Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41. Look at verse 6 and 7. We'll just kind of fly through this a little bit. Um, verse 5. The isle saw it and feared, uh, feared. The ends of the earth were afraid. They drew near and came. They helped each other, his neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer, him that uh, uh, smote with the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, and it is, uh, that it should not be moved. What's going on? We're dealing with idol worship here again. And what's going on? All these... Uh, these heathen, they're coming together and they're encouraging one another in the work of their own hands. Again, this is why God said, I don't accept that. <laughs> I don't accept that kind of, a, kind of an altar. Okay, quickly, um, Isaiah 44. And just go down to verse, oh boy. <clears throat> uh, verse 10, just verse 9. And they that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and they are detectable things shall not, and shall not profit. Uh, and they are their own witness. They see not, they know not, uh, that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god or a molten graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellow shall be ashamed. And the workmen, they are, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet, uh, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashion it with hammers, uh, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he's hungry, uh, and in his strength, his strength faileth. He drinketh no water in his faint. The, cop the carpenter stretcheth it with his rule. He maketh it out with, marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes. He marketh it out with a compass. He maketh it uh, after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man that remaineth in the house. He hewn down, uh, down cedars. And all. You, you, you've all read this. All You don't know the story. What's going on here? Hey, this is the madness that took place over in Sodom. Those people there beaten on the door. They get blinded. And what do they do? They keep groping for the door. They're blinded with madness. They are in the, their, their lust. They're determined to accomplish their, uh, their goal. 
What's going on here? We got idol worship going on. It's religious. And these people, these craftsmen, they're so blinded by they got to get this thing done. We got to reach our goal. We've got to accomplish our design. And what is it? Man, they're hungry. They won't even take a break to eat a, you know, a sub sandwich or something. They, they, they don't eat, they don't drink. Why? We got to get this done. They're determined. They're committed. They're committed to their own destruction. That's the idolatry. They're using their tools for their glory, for their end. I, man, I'm going <laughs> to. So, what's going on? Um, nothing's changed. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, right? In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. What is it? You got the, you got the, where we are, we got the Mohammedans. They are so blinded and they're, they're building, they're building mosques uh, at an uh, astronomical rate. Um, they're blinded. It's, it's their altar and they're hewing stones and timbers with their own tools for their own glory, their own, their own strength, their own might. Um, let, let me do this. Um, again, you, you, all, you all know Solomon builds this temple and it's all made with all these incredibly expensive, precious uh, metals and jewels and whatnot. And the, the timber of Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon, um, I, I have some Lebanese friends that I deal with quite regularly over there. And um, he's shown me pictures of some of those trees. They're just magnificent specimens of God's creation. But so the, it's all valuable stuff. But what about today? God's building a house today, as we all know, you know. And, and what could be more valuable than a man's soul, okay? I, I only got five minutes, so I can't, I can't go through, through all of that. But you know, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, uh, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, uh, the, your body's an earthen vessel housing the treasure of Jesus Christ, the hope of our glory. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse, let's do that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Look at verse 20. A year built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple of the Lord in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, there's, there's God's building project for our day and age. Now, I, I'm sorry I'm rushing through so much of this, but I really want to get one, two last thoughts out. When God told Noah to build that ark, for 120 years, God had to endure the sounds of those iron tools, those hammers, those chisels, those saws, those graving tools, all of that. I think that was a very unpleasant sound to God. Why? Because judgment was imminent. God had to judge. That's how, that's how bad things had gotten. I don't think God was pleased with those sounds at all, just like he's never been pleased with us picking up a hammer to our own glory, building our own, our own alt altars. But let me just finish with this thought. Man in his pride and his lust for power, and God the Father bearing those insidious sounds, when we picked up a nail, and with our strong arm, picked up that hammer and drove those nails, three nails, right through God's heart. Look at Psalm 89. The madness of man's heart, the unregenerated heart, picks up a tool, picks up a piece of iron, and pollutes anything he touches. Okay, look at Psalm 89. Um, look at verse 13. Thou, thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are thy habitation, uh, the habitation of thy throne. 
That's Genesis 12. That's where, uh, uh, six, that's where, that's where God has to judge. After the colon, though, mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Ble well, let, let, let me just do this. Look. Um, those three sounds, those three nails, what is it? Those are three sounds that were heard by God in heaven. But those are the very same three sounds that have gone completely around the world. What is it? That's the gospel. Jesus Christ, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's the gospel. Those three nails drove those, those hands and those feet to that cross. There's the altar that God had designed. And there's the last sacrifice, the substitutionary sacrifice. That's the gospel, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those three sounds have gone around this world. The sound that God now hears isn't that iron, those iron tools, but it's the spoken word of God as Solomon exercised over there. And what does it do? It's that word of God that overcomes that stony heart. Not with an iron, a tool of iron, but with the word of God, with that, with that heart that will receive that testimony. <clears throat> Look at verse 15. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. That's not the sound of iron tools. That's not the sound of that engraving tool. The joyful sound. That's the only place in the Bible where those two words go together like that. The joyful sound, they shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. The joyful sound, that's the sound that God hears now, the sound of the gospel going throughout the world. Okay? Just a minute. Now, let's finish with this. Galatians chapter 6. I'm sorry, I'm taking I'm two minutes over. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6. Blessed are the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. The joyful sound, the gospel going throughout the world. Look at John, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now that's an easy verse to say and read. and The first half of it's outstanding. The world is crucified unto me. I can do that. I can easily do that. You just deny yourself with, a, with, with some self-discipline. You can deny the world. But it doesn't end there. <laughs> By whom? Jesus Christ, the world is crucified unto me, and I, I, unto the world. I think that's the joyful sound that God wants to hear. What is it? Crucifying yourself, putting yourself on that cross, and making yourself unattractive to this world. It's very easy to say, oh, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do these things anymore, you know. Yeah, well, praise the Lord for that. God made that change in you. But now what are you doing? Now what are you doing? Hey. The world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. How am I making the world not like me? I guess that means I'm done, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Silent nails of self-crucifixion. Not the old tools of iron. Last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter three. Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. There's the reputation, talking about David and Solomon, right? Ye are our epistle, for as much as you know you are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone. I pray your stone isn't, your heart isn't stone anymore. Not uh, tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust that we, to, uh, we through Christ uh, Godward. 
It's the word of God. And uh, it's only the word of God that's going to, going to build that, that temple that God is interested in now. That's God's building project for our, for our day and age. And it's those three nails. It's no longer the sound of, a, of an iron tool. It's the, sound, it's the sound of his word right there, the living, living word of God. Father in heaven, we thank you for the time. Ask your blessing, Father, uh, on the words that have gone on. I apologize for going late. Lord God, please, please bless as you see fit, Father. And I do, find, I do pray that you find us as fit vessels ready to be used through the rest of the service as you bring the word of God to us, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would empower it to our hearts. Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us so dearly. We ask your blessing now on this time and service in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Wow. All right, we'll meet back in in 15 minutes from right now. See you then. Bye-bye.